welcome to another gorgeous day on planet Earth, another day of Dose of Did You Know, where intriguing, inspiring, unique individuals come to talk about love and life and how it has brought them to where they are today. And with me from some unknown location, because I don't even know, I think you're on the East Coast. It's Will. Will, how are you? Great, Danny. Doing well. And uh, I love your theme of love and life. And I'm in lovely Maryland. And mm. bring it just outside of Fort Meade in a great location that is sort of the intersection between Baltimore, D.C. and Annapolis. Okay, so all I know about that is when I took my last road trip a couple weeks ago from Florida up here, you can't stop to use the bathroom anywhere in that area. It is all closed. So FYI out there, anyone who's listening, you better bring a bucket or something. I ended up going like, I'm like, I'm going to get arrested for public indecency because I had to pee behind our like big truck tire. Awful way too much knowledge to share, but these are things people need to know if they're going to be traveling. Absolutely. It's good, good practical experience. Right, I'm. I I can wear stilettos and still like rough it out there in the real world. Like, come on now. Um, but before we get going, what? Um, who is Will? Well, Danny, thanks for asking that question. I'm originally from Long Island, New York. So a shout out to any fellow New Yorkers out there. And you know, I grew up in the South Shore, a town called Bay Shore. And you know, great experience. Uh, raised by a single mom and a, you know, I call it middle class experience. But very yeah. fortunate to have the extended family in the area. So that's always unique when you grow up with like the ability to visit grandparents, aunts, uncles. Uh, Love sports my whole life. And while while I was in high school, learned about the opportunity to attend the U.S. Military Academy at at West Point. My main incentive, candidly, was sport. So that was my experience. And I had, uh, like many of my generation, you know, born in 67, so many of us had grandparents or some parents that had served in World War II or, or, or Korea and even Vietnam. And I was positively influenced. I actually had my, I had a grandmother who served in the Women's Army Corps. And really? she was just a great lady. And she, uh, while serving in the Medical Corps, met an injured paratrooper who ended up becoming my grandfather. <laughs> And then on uh, you know, my mother's side, my grandfather was a Navy veteran who you know, served in the bowels of an aircraft carrier during World War II. But both of these gentlemen, as well as my grandmother, had a great influence of you know, teaching me the example of service. Mm -hmm. um, so through, through West Point, I had a great experience overall at the academy, uh, mostly because of athletics and the folks I was uh, influenced by my coaches. Yeah. And then a very quick, I say quick 24-year career, only because... The great majority of it, I really enjoyed the people I served with, the people I served under, and the people that I served. And that was quick, fast, and furious. Um, then I retired in 2015, settled in the Maryland area. My second passion, you know, outside of the military has always been in athletics. And I was yeah. fortunate enough to spend a couple of years in college athletics and a short time in professional athletics. And then I found an organization that is truly my, my, my why. And that's Soldiers of Sidelines, who really brings these two um, lines of effort together for me. And that's supporting veterans and serving through athletics. And that's Soldiers of Sidelines. So oh gosh, that's a good, you know, succinct description, Danny. Yeah, and I have so many questions. So I love how you were raised in that extended family because I was I was a single mom for a long time, and the biggest thing as I is I raised my children near like my brother, my father. There was that uh, multi-generational influence that they had. Until this day, I mean, my youngest is 19, although Brett out there, if you watch us or anybody knows him, he's in trouble. So he needs to talk to his boss and his brother and his mother. Just shout out there. That's how it works when you have an extended family. Everybody, you don't just talk, answer to one person. You answer to a multitude of people. But I really think that made a difference in who you are. I think it really makes a difference in people in general when they have that experience that is killed in America. It's just, yeah, it's not. Yeah, I know, Danny, that's so that, that is a great point. And I was very fortunate. So I, I just planted that seed because I could ride my bike around my hometown. And within two miles, I had like eight different stops I could make. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, especially at those, what I call my Tom Sawyer years, right? You're like 12 years old. You don't have a job. You have no responsibilities. You're with your buddies. 
I would just go visit aunts and uncles and candidly they would feed me, we would chit chat, <laughs> and then I would move on to the next. And yeah. they all had an incremental influence on me. You know, mm -hmm. it had strengths and you know, candidly weaknesses, but collectively I learned so much. I had I had a great uncle who was a medical doctor and he used to just spend time with me and it was it was really fabulous and you know I had other aunts and uncles that maybe achieved less professionally but they also taught me whether it was the love of life, the love of sport. Um and mm -hmm. I, I do think that was a collective now I don't want to sound like a hypocrite because my kids grew up as military kids. But right. they found that extended family through folks that I served with. And mm -hmm. that void of aunts and uncles and grandparents and cousins was really filled by the folks that I served with. So I don't think my kids lost out, but it, was, yeah. it wasn't it was a blood relation. It was a relation through passion of service. I was just going to say- They have many folks that they call aunts and uncles, but aren't blood related. Right, and I was going to say that, and you kind of like went there anyways, is that it doesn't necessarily have to be blood there are many if you look around your community and you're just like little nucleus you're gonna have grandparents age you're gonna have aunts and uncles you're gonna have cousins so you just have to kind of get out of our own way and interact <laughs> with people and find right. that connection but it's super super cool and what a badass i always say women back like in world war ii and and vietnam that era that served I always, and I've never actually been able to have a conversation. I've never met somebody face to face. I've only heard the stories, but I can just imagine there's something like beyond badassness. Cause it's like, they were yeah. the four mothers of this, you know? Oh, Danny, that, and you know, I think, unfortunately my grandmother who was the army veteran passed away about a decade ago. Uh, but I'll always remember the stories she would share with me. She, took what I would call a non-conventional path. You know, she was, uh, grew up on Long Island, started at Cornell University. So she was one of those few, Cornell was one of the first to actually accept women within the Ivy League. But then she left school and joined the army, much to her parents' chagrin. You know, it was 1943, it was, you know, it's kind of swept up. Yeah. And then she met my grandfather who was literally a cowboy from Utah. And, you know, the rest is, it, it, maybe it's not a all, you know, glamorous uh, future, but that, that, that was the dynamic. So, like, so she was very proud of her service, and I'll never forget getting to share with her when I came back from Afghanistan and then Iraq. It was actually my grandmother, her and I would have these great conversations because she mm. saw so many veterans as in the medical corps. Yeah. You know, so she would see folks that were suffering from these injuries, like like my grandfather, who she ended up marrying. But she just she really had a great empathy towards mm -hmm. veterans that had both physical and then oftentimes non physical injuries. And yeah. an incredible empathetic woman. Man, she yeah, she saw it before there was ever a name to it. You just had an understanding of it. You just you knew they just didn't have it labeled. So she had. She had oh, so much knowledge and experience. Wow. That's very cool. You're very, very lucky. I'm, I'm a little jealous in a good way. Like, like, wow, what? I just want to talk to you about your grandmother. Sorry. Yeah, no, Sorry, no. Will. Forget you. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I guess some of my fondest memories is um, she would attend my football games at, at, at West Point and then some of the away games. And she came to our 1988 Sunball game which was in El Paso, Texas, and we were playing University of Alabama. So it was a big deal. I mean, you know, yeah. here we were, West Point Army, playing the, the University of Alabama, and my grandmother showed up with her cowbell that she would ring. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was Isn't just... that, that is a good, cowbells, if anybody who has a collegiate um, athlete, <laughs> you better show up with a cowbell. I remember my brother, he, he was a gymnast at Iowa, and that's what it was. I was like, a cowbell, really? And my now my sister in law she's like, oh yeah, oh yeah, it's wild and crazy at these college competitions. And it really is. Now my son is doing it and I see the whole thing. But okay, so back on track, here you are now. How did you end up finding um, soldiers to sidelines? Because I'm a big believer God perfectly places things in your life at the timing when you're ready to see them. Well, actually, let me take that back. 
I think he sprinkles things in your life. And, and then when you're actually ready to see them, you've learned the lessons that you need to learn or you've grown to a place that you need to be. Then you get to see his blessing because that's very, it seems perfect sense that this is where you would be from your past yeah, to now. So well said. And I, I do believe in some of that, um, you know, the messages that come, whether it's divine intervention or just pure ser serendipity. Mm -hmm. um, but it was serendipitous, but I got to meet Harrison Bernstein in the summer of 2019 while I was with the Chesapeake Bayhawks of the Major League Lacrosse, and I really loved the organization. Here was an organization supporting veterans and service members getting the coaching, and at the time, Harrison was an organization of one, like it was himself, with a, with a committed volunteer board, but they had no other staff members, and he was just driven by passion and this vision. And I candidly bought into it. Uh, so when the Bayhawks were sold, when you talk about, again, either divine intervention or, or serendipity, <laughs> it allowed me to say, what do I really want to do? What's my next why? And I reached out to Harrison and just candidly told him I'm willing to do whatever it takes. And he was surprised. He's like, wow, well, this is awesome. And we've been, you know, I've been officially part of the team since July, but months prior to that, passionately involved and you know yeah. candidly we are we are things are going well because we we leveraged uh, COVID to design a virtual program that has actually increased our reach to veterans and service members and we transitioned very rapidly from a uh, in-person process to a virtual but the benefit has been now we have service members stationed abroad it was amazing during our you know, the January lacrosse is a great example. We had six individuals stationed abroad during our most recent women, military women's seminar, which is something I'm very proud of. We didn't have as many uh, abroad outside the continental U.S., but it was amazing. We had almost 30 states represented, and we would not be able to provide those services without having a virtual model. Right. So that was really a blessing when you talk about, again, what, why things happen when they happen. And then the partnerships that we've developed, we just had our sponsorship for the Military Women's Seminar, Higher Echelon, which is an organization that, although relatively small, is passionately aligned with us, and we're very grateful to them. You yeah. Know, like, like many veteran service organizations, you know, we look for quality of partnerships. And you know, one of the advantages that we have um, is that we are very narrowly focused by design, and we are grateful or just fortunate that we don't have a, a competitor, right? There's only one organization helping veterans and service members get into coaching, and that's sold to the sidelines. And then lastly, Danny, because it may be germane to your population of, of listeners, in July, we're opening up to military spouses. And I bring that up because, as my wife reminded me very candidly, guess who's oftentimes available to coach? That's the spouse. And whether yeah. it's a female or male, doesn't matter. But it's, so we are going to do that very deliberately starting in January and uh, but that's a bit of the how I got involved and you're right it was divine intervention I am convinced yeah so how do um so is are you finding that the people that the veterans that come to you and then soon to be the spouses that come to you that they had some sort of athleticism before that they were you know on a team or that they just like sports like what is the, the yeah that ideal, what do they call that? The avatar. Yeah, the, the avatar or the, uh, yeah, what, what, what is the persona of our soldier coaches, right? That, yeah. That's what I looked at it. It's really very, the great example, I'll go, again, go back to our lacrosse seminar, but you could also reference our military women's seminar. Uh, for lacrosse, we had 43 individuals go through this, this process and a very broad, it was probably our most diverse in terms of all the services, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, even Coast Guard. We had retirees, we had active duty, we had uh, reservists, we had National Guards uh, folks. And then we had this broad spectrum of lacrosse experience. Probably our most experienced was a gentleman named Neil Duffy, who was a retired Navy captain that was an All-American in 1984, Navy lacrosse, right? So he's like the highest end of lacrosse acumen. Then we had a young Marine Lance Corporal that was like, hey, I played two years in high school, but 
<laughs> you know, I just want to get involved in coaching. But what was great, Danny, is that this this entire spectrum from from Neil Duffy down to our you know Lance Corporal, all said that it benefited them, and they've each become their our, our own little apostles of spreading the good word going forward. And that is hard. I am so proud of our ability to connect across the spectrum of, you know, 40 years of lacrosse experience or four months of lacrosse experience. And we didn't talk down to the top and we didn't talk above the bottom. We really found these collaborative topics mm -hmm. that was, was fostering each of their growth, right? So for Neil, that may be a refining, what's the latest stuff going on? And right. for the young coach, it may be just understanding the basics. And it was an amazing response from the cadre of coaching legends. We had a gentleman named Bill Tierney, who coaches at the University of Denver now, but has won an incredible amount of uh, national championships. And candidly, maybe the greatest coach of, of all time. He came on and spent 90 minutes telling our soldier coaches his coaching path. Right? He went yeah. to college not even expecting to play he played baseball in high school. So what wow. was great is for folks to understand, here's arguably the greatest coach in college lacrosse today who did not play lacrosse until he went to college. But he learned. He had an appetite to learn, right? Mm -hmm. He was yeah. willing to take in. He was willing to be humble. He was willing to do all these things. And then, you know, today he stands as this iconic figure. So that may be a, a long answer to your question, but there is a very diverse persona. We are proud of that. Uh, we have four sports, football, basketball, lacrosse, and sport performance. And what we did, uh, something that we may continue, was our first military women, only because when I came on board, we did a, a quick assessment of our inventory of soldier coaches, and we found only about 3% were, were women. Mm. And our goal is really to represent the force. And the force is about 16 to 19 percent female, you know, depending on the services. So that was our goal, right? Like we want to reflect the force that we serve. And thanks to this seminar, we now exceed that goal because we had so many women. We had almost 60 women, military women complete the certification. That's awesome. It's always nice when you hit those like you you have a goal and then you like hit it and exceed it and you're like, shoot, that was that was easy. Let's um move on. You know when you were talking about um you know that great the greatest coach I forgot his name but uh, yeah, in Tierney, the crowd. Tierney, Bill Tierney, yep. Yeah, he is the things that make you a good coach. So before I do what I did now, I was a professional ballerina. My brother was a gymnast, he lived at the Olympic Training Center. So we have, we're all professional athletes. My mother was, my father was. We owned a gymnastics school where we created um, international champions, um, all of this stuff. So I understand the basis. And the biggest thing is that humility. Coaching is not about the coach. It is about the person you're coaching so if you are a coach and you get your i don't know your greatness comes from what you produce you are never going to produce and you're going to not be a very great coach at all because you're going to be self-serving and that's not what, what it's all about so no wonder that guy was so good um because he was humble he learned a yeah. new sport he just wanted to take it all in which gave him such a foundation and why God, it makes sense that I'm really happy that this um, soldiers to sidelines came about because how perfect is it as a as a military member? You're there to serve like majority of people go in. They're going to have these ones that don't whatever they do it for their own reason. But majority of veterans I know went became a serve joined the service right. to serve something greater than themselves. That's it. Wow. So like transitioning and then you get out of that transition and sometimes that need to fulfill just that service you know you don't how do you put a name or um, a job or a hobby on that need to serve well coaching creating the next level of or the next generation of human beings that's it I mean, you you have captured the essence of what inspires us within Soldiers of the Sidelines. You know, it's it's service, it's gratitude, it's humility, it's giving back, it's having a cause greater than yourself. Those are all the attributes 
And then you also, I think, touched on a topic that coaches come in so many different stripes. There is no cookie cutter approach. And yeah. in my opinion, in my humble opinion, it's just be authentic. Because yeah. I've had coaches that are so diverse. And, but as long as they were who they are, that authenticity, it really connects with us as the athletes, right? Because you have to be true to yourself. Mm-hmm. And, and as long mm-hmm. as they're authentic and then, you know, they're, they're going to be able to connect and influence. Because I had a great diversity of coaches. I had coaches, some that were military veterans, some that knew nothing about the military. But I didn't assess them because of their military service. I assessed them to how authentic were they? You know, how selfless yeah. were they? Now, we think, just like you said, that veterans are this great population that already have attributes, one that they took into the service. So I never want to discredit. Many of them have the attributes before the military. Mm-hmm. But the military clearly helps all of us that are veterans refine, become more aware, learn some of the vernacular, uh, to then transition back into coaching. And we do believe, we at Soldiers of Silence truly believe that it's a sweet spot. We are yeah. serving back to the community. We're also serving the soldier coach. And candidly, I've had some of them share with me very personal stories mm-hmm. that directly influence their own wellness. Oh, yeah. You, you can't give... Like when you really are coaching and that's your passion, right? When you're really serving, you can't give your all without it changing you back. It, it doesn't work. It's it's not a one-sided right. thing. I like totally see um, completely that um, understanding of that. It's um, I feel it so much is bringing me back to like my own coaching you know and the impact coming from it could be from a two-year-old to a 34 year old it doesn't matter that it's that influence when you give your heart you receive back what your um what your heart heart is and i want to talk about that being authentic piece before we kind of wrap up here is that just like children i think when children are very they're just pure, right? They'll tell you, they'll be like, what is that on your face? And you're like, oh, great, I'm saying, you know, they'll just say it like it is. But when you, even as adults, when you are coaching and and there's an adult that's really trying to learn and push themselves past their comfort zone, is that they become very pure and they can smell out when you're bullshitting. Like children, and when you let down everything to try to achieve something, you can smell bullshit. So yeah, if you're not authentic, you're gonna have a very, uh, a very short career. You're gonna find that it's not for you. I should say you're gonna find that that part of coaching and serving is not for you. That's it. I agree. That's what I think. That's my my two cents from my year, my years, you know, from yeah, retiring. You were, you were also, you know, you were exposed to many coaches through your performance career, right? And, mm-hmm. You know, as a dancer, ballerina, performer, gymnast. I mean, that one-on-one coaching is probably more intense than much of the coaching because I I mostly was part of team sports, but I know yeah. how intense. Just anecdotally those individual sports can be. And, you know, I think by continuing to expose our youth to a breadth of these sports experience, you know, each one will find. And then if I was just to make another, you know, comment, um, I think sports serves as a great tool to teach life lessons. And it's Mm -hmm. unfortunately, there is a little bit of tinge of individual performance and accolades has a higher priority over than just being a member of the team. But that's only because sports now reflects the greater societal changes, right? So it's not, you know, sports doesn't drive the way society thinks. Society drives the way sports thinks. And I think, unfortunately, we have a high attrition of athletes uh, because they confuse personal success with why you really play sports. And again, this is conceptual, this is aspirational. But I think by continuing to work with our youth coaches, which is my passion, kind of youth and scholastic, we can have a positive influence on the aggregate of society. It's not going to be the answer to everything, by no means. Uh, But I think we all see how sports led in many areas like 
racial integration, like raising women's equity issues, right? It's just sports, just, and this is not condemning whether it should or should not be, it's just, just the American way, right? In America today, <laughs> if you go back from, from, from Jackie Robinson and forward, you know, sports has been leading societal changes, whether it's awareness of Title IX, it's women's athletics today, and um, I'm not here to comment whether that's positive or negative, but it is what it is. And I think our small contribution right. of coaches can help with that. And the aggregate effect over the years and decades will be positive. Mm. I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. My brother and I used to say gymnastics is just the facilitator of creating amazing human beings, right? That know all of these basic morals. That's it. That's it. We just right. have the gift of that talent, right? In that right. in that field. Um, but again, nothing ever to is one. It's the collaboration of multiple pieces. So just do your piece, whatever yeah. that piece is. Just <laughs> do your piece the best that you can. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you know, can. I would I, I would Danny, if I was to give one other comment, uh, you know, one of the things that I learned in sport and it was really validated in the army is that your role on your team is not proportional to the impact that you're having. Mm. And if I was to just give you even a more specific, uh, and I was fortunate to serve in special operations, and I can say it now in, in a Delta Force. And, and my Delta Force commander once had a, a, a comment that was so inspiring. He said, your relevancy to the mission is not proportional to your proximity to the target. And what he was saying is everybody has a role. And that is so transferable to sport, right? Because mm -hmm. if you may be the person responsible for the jerseys of your youth team, but you throw that personalized jersey on a 10-year-old girl soccer player, she might give that extra energy, right? It's about yeah. building that like confidence. Your job as a player may be as a backup, but it's what you do in practice that contributes, right? There's like, so just to understand that it may not be reflected in the scorecard or what the, you know, end of the day is reflected statistically, but just to understand that everybody has a role and that really helped me, you know, and when I reflect on my time in Army Athletics, I'm as proud of the, as the guys who are on the scout team who never played a down of Army football, but they gave 100%. And they were tough sons of guns. They were tough as nails. Mm -hmm. And it's the same in the military, and I, I think it's the same in society. But we often don't don't talk about those folks that operate in the shadows, and that's okay. Yeah. But I think we as soldiers of silence do do recognize that it's a comprehensive effort. Hmm. Yeah. So well said. So well said. So before I let you go and finish yeah. all your amazing work that you have to do today, as I you answer this last question, first thing that comes to your mind, um, no need to explain if you don't want to or explain if you do. But in this moment right now, Will, what does love mean to you? Love is being selfless and subordinating your own desires to uh, support your loved ones. Mm. Yeah, that does sum you up. Not easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, not easy. <laughs> Simple, all, but not easy. Right. All love, because it comes, it changes all the time. It's a ripple. It takes effort every single moment. It's, it's that's how that's how it works. So thank you so much for sharing a little bit of who you are, what you do, why you do it. Um, I really appreciate that. And to everybody else out there, remember always love hard, love pure, and love proactive. Until next time, take care. Thanks, Dan.